pages. Finally, I remembered to do it. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Terry Paggi. Um, I am with the US Coast Guard Auxiliary and uh, we are the uniformed all volunteer component of uh, Team Coast Guard. Um, basically, we can engage in any missions that the Coast Guard uh, can do uh, with the exception of combat and law enforcement, and we don't get paid for it. So we are a, uh, uh, a very important component to them. And I will go ahead and um, get started here. Um, my assistant, Cricket Baltz, her parents were not hippies, that was her nickname. Um, she will be handling any questions. So if you have a question, um, you can go ahead and hit the chat and she's a very experienced paddler and uh, she will um, do her darndest to get you an answer. So anyway, um, we started doing this um, back uh, in the late 50s, the American economy really took off. It really boomed and it really allowed um, the average American to become involved in recreational boating. And on the downside to that was that um, along with now many boats and many untrained, uneducated um, boaters, um, there was a huge spike in accidents and fatalities. And it got so bad that in 1971, Congress passed the Safe Boating Act, which mandated the Coast Guard uh, to um, provide recreational boaters with uh, education um, uh, 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 presentations very much similar to this one. Um, making information available to the boating public uh, to try to um, reduce and um, minimize accidents and fatalities. And what they found is as the recreational boaters became educated, um, actually fatalities and um, injuries, uh, accidents did start to decline. However, um, in 1987, the, the popularity prior to then, you know, we had canoes, uh, you know, for the, all the purists, um, but kayaking started to come onto the scene. And so what they, the Coast Guard does is each August, they come out with a report and it's made available to the public, so you can you can go online and 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 see it and read it and um, you know it's got all, just tons of information. Um, but they started they put paddlecraft into their own separate category, and what they found was that while deaths and and, and injuries accidents were from power boating was declining. The same was not, uh, it was not the same for paddle preps, uh, you know, and we will see later in this presentation that since 1987, uh, fatalities uh, with the exception of a couple of years have been steadily climbing every year because the sport um, is very, very popular. Um, so, I have the statistics for 2020, 2021 will not come out until August. Um, I have a feeling that it'll probably be the deadliest year for paddlers um, that we have ever experienced. Um, it was, there were quite a few fatalities across the nation. Um, one of the biggest contributing factors um, two paddle craft fatalities that we have found was inexperience of the operator. 
And by this, I mean, you know, somebody that's new um, and we've all been there. Uh, there's more to this sport than just plopping our behinds into a, a, a pit you know, a kayak and putting on a PFD and pointing ourselves in the right direction and paddling. There's a, a lot of things that can happen to us and it's the inexperienced people that can get themselves into trouble um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and possibly lose, lose their lives. So anyway, okay, there's a rule of paddling with, and it goes probably for a lot of other type of sports, but we have two types of paddlers. We have those that have gone for an unexpected swim and those that will go for an unexpected swim. Because if you do this long enough, sooner or later, you're going to get wet and it's not going to be when you want it. And we're hoping that at least when you can, you, we, you sign off from here tonight, that you will walk, you know, walk away with um, some things to think about um, before you get out on the water and before you become involved in one of these um, um, situations that you will have some idea of what to do. Okay. Um, I'm on social media a lot, whether it's doing, uh, promoting these, these, these classes, just I, I, I look out there and I see um, you know, what the public's opinion is on certain things. And just about every day, I see somebody that puts out, hello, I'm a newbie. I've never paddled before. What's the best? And I'm going to use the word kayak, okay, because kayaks do make up probably at least 80, 85% of the paddle craft now. Um, stand-ups, you know, they're popular, but, um, and then you have your purest canoe people and, um, and, but kayaks are by far the most numerous. So if I say kayak, I, I mean paddle craft. It's just um, one of those things that um, sometimes, you know, you try to lump everything into one, but, um, and so they will ask what type of kayak and, and, and probably the worst thing that you, one of the worst things you could do on social media is ask for somebody's opinion because you will get a hundred billion of them. And, and to, what I could tell people is the right type of paddle craft for you is the one that you, you like, you enjoy, you're gonna use in a safe environment. And not all paddle, you know, and, and we'll look at, you know, kayaks, especially there's different ones for different water. Okay. It's not, there is no one size fits all. So one of the things um, <clears throat> that we see is like the, 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 the touring kayak up there. Um, it's, it's made to go for long distances. It's made to go out onto uh, big bodies of water. You can wear, uh, I will show you a picture of a spray skirt that will go over the cockpit um, and keep you keep it dry in there. Um, and it's made to go fast. As you can see, it's, it's fairly narrow. Um, however, these are not meant to, well, I mean, you could use them on smaller lakes um, and then some smaller rivers, but when, if there's too many turns, um, you know, it's, it's, it's too much boat for the size of, you know, the, uh, the water that you're on. Um, then we have the sit-ons and then sit-ons. Oh, and one of the things with the sit-ins is because they are a little bit narrower, um, they are a little bit more apt to turn over. Um, so uh, again, they're, they're fairly easy to get back in once you can, uh, you know, uh, teach yourself the technique. Um, now with the sit ons, uh, you can see in the middle, that's a tandem, uh, one for, you know, built for two people. 
and we have the fishermen up on the upper right hand corner. Um, these are meant for um, slow moving rivers. They're meant for small enclosed protected bodies of water. Um, you would not want to probably take these out onto you know, uh, the Great Lakes or the ocean or um, uh, you know, like some of our bigger inland lakes um, or fast running rivers because they do, are, you're, you are exposed, okay? Um, and, and we had um, an unfortunate situation a couple of years back in uh, Lake Superior where a family rented, um, actually they rented a, a tandem and they had um, their three children with them. Everybody was wearing life jackets. They paddled. Now this uh, craft should not have been taken out onto Lake Superior. They didn't look at the, uh, the, the weather. Uh, the winds kicked up. And we, we do know that one of the waves came over, over the uh, craft and knocked one of the kids out into the water. The father then went in after. Um, and to end it, um, the mother was able to swim to an island. Um, and the next following day, the bodies of the father and three children were recovered. Uh, all were still in their PFDs, uh, but they did succumb to hypothermia. So um, they were on a craft that should not have been out on the water that they were on. Um, so, and then we have our stand-ups there in the middle. And uh, one of the things that you may want to look at is, and especially if you have a recreational boat, um, it, uh, these are, some people refer to them as flotation bags, flotation cells. Um, and these would be for sit-ins that do not have a bulkhead. Um, a lot of your uh, more expensive high-end uh, touring kayaks, uh, where the hatches are, there's going to be a bulkhead, which is a nautical term for some type of wall. And this will act as like airbags in the bow and the stern, for forward and uh, back. Um, so if you do tip over your craft, you can actually get back into it, use a bilge pump to empty the water out, and you can pretty much go on your way. Um, if you do not have a bulkhead, and there's nothing in there that will um, assist you in floating. Um, these are very, very important um, items for you to have. Okay, this one, nothing starts a fight on Facebook quicker than politics, religion, or PFDs. However, um, these things, um, let me tell you, if people wore these, all the time, um, there would be probably no need for me to be speaking like this. Um, nine out of every 10 paddle craft fatalities um, are from drowning. And of those, 86% are not wearing a life jacket or per, uh, PFD, personal flotation devices, we call them. All right, um, they should be worn and they should be worn correctly, <clears throat> meaning snugly, not open in the front. Um, last week, or last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, I, I was on a, a social media site and a woman, it, she kind of like, she goes, I'm a believer now. And Long and short, she, her and her son never wore life jackets. They kept them in the craft, but they never wore them. And they were on a river and it was a lot colder than what, you know, because they touched the water right near the shore, which is a little bit warmer. Plus you're using your hands or your feet, which because they are so exposed all the time, you don't really get a true temperature feeling <clears throat> from them. And they went into the water. And um, they come around a bend and there was an obstruction. There was a tree there and it, it actually is called a strainer. I'll, I'll show you a picture of one. Um, she hit it, went overboard and her paddle craft, paddle and life jacket went further down the river. Her son then went overboard. Um, 
they couldn't believe how actually cold the water was. It was felt a lot colder now that they were in it. Um, and that luckily they made it to shore and they, they do, um, they are now advocates for life jackets. I mean, nothing will make you wear something, um, you know, uh, you know, once you've gone through some type of, you know, life altering experience. Um, children under the age of 13 are required to wear them all the time. Um, when you buy young people life jackets, and I remember growing up, my parents, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So and the kids were always growing and your parents would sometimes buy things for kids to grow into. Um, PFDs are not one of them. You should be buying them one a year um, because you buy them one year, they're going to uh, outgrow it, uh, pass it on to somebody else who's got a child that could fit into it and put them in a new one. Because if it's too big for them, there's a good chance they can slip out through the bottom. Um, one of the nice alternatives um, in the upper right is a manual and manually inflatable life uh, vest. And I've tried one of these on and even in the hottest weather, it, you really don't even realize that it's on. Um, there's a yellow handle there. So if you go into the water, you just yank on it nice and hard. And there's a CO2 cartridge in there. It, it pops and the whole thing inflates. We do not recommend self uh, inflating ones because just like car airbags, they can go off when you don't want them. And you really don't want to be paddling you know, halfway through your trip and then all of a sudden it got wet or, or who knows why it exposed, you know, the CO2 cartridge popped and, and now you got this big inflatable thing around you. So it's better off that you do it yourself rather than, you know, going with the automatic, automated one. And you are required to have a sound device. And this is a nice little whistle. You can buy them. Uh, we actually, if you ever see us, um, the auxiliary, uh, I purchased several dozen uh, myself and we give them away at um, when we are out um, uh, at certain locations doing vessel safety checks. If somebody doesn't have one, we will give them one. Um, it should be secured to your uh, PFD. Um, these are very good to have on you because you, you, you'll see that in a, in, a, in a, we have a little short video at the, towards the end, but you, um, when you, even when you're in a, a PFD, um, you are going to be very low in the water. And if you, somebody, they're looking for you and it's getting dusk, that whistle can really help them direct to, uh, direct the, the rescuers uh, to you. So it's uh, one of the things that uh, is required now um, in, uh, in all states. Okay, paddling is like just about any other sport. Probably the cheapest thing you're gonna buy is the actual item. And then all the add-ons is what costs all the money. So we're gonna go through a few of these things that are, are out here. Okay, as you see in the back, um, the, uh, this is a, um, a sit-in touring kayak. Um, it's made for speed. It's made for long distance. Uh, it, they are very easy to paddle rather than a, a wider um, sit on top, um, but they're made for certain types of water. Now here on the left, this is a spray skirt. So if you're unfamiliar with that, um, this is something that you would step in and it would look like a skirt. And as you got into the cockpit of your sit-in, you would then push it around the outer edges of the cockpit. And so if waves come over the top, um, the water will not fill into your craft and uh, cause you some comfort and discomfort and concern. Um, here we have a PFD, should always, always, always wear it. 
I, I, I just can't, I, I cannot stress that enough. And nobody can ever, you know, give me a reason why they don't. And um, there's never a good reason. Okay, next to it, um, you know, people in the South, you guys are in the warm water uh, up here in the North. Um, a lot of our deeper water is still very, very cold and uh, cold water is a killer. So for people that paddle and we have people that paddle pretty much all year round, as long as the water's not frozen, um, they'll be out on it. And this is a dry suit versus a wet suit. And the thing about a dry suit is, is it, as the name says, it keeps you dry. Uh, different than a wetsuit. Uh, I'm a scuba diver and I have a, a seven millimeter wetsuit and the wetsuit actually lets water in and then your body heat between that and the inside of the suit is, is supposed to heat the water to keep you warm. And it, it does for a certain period of time. However, under you know most cold conditions, a dry suit is the way that you want to go. We always recommend carrying two sets of paddles. You never know when, uh, I mean, I've seen people get into their craft and they're rearing their shore and they're using the blade of the paddle to kind of push themselves out. And you don't realize that you may be breaking that. Um, and so, um, you know, halfway through your trip, you, it, the blade may break and now you're stuck. You're gonna have to like canoe paddle. So we always recommend carrying two. If, you know, somebody in your group loses one or something else, you, you know, you can always lend them one to assist. So it's, it's, it's just a good idea to carry two. You can put them under the deck lines, uh, the bungee cords there, and they're out of the way and uh, you can be a real hero to somebody. Um, the gray bag here, this is a throw bag. Um, I always carried one of these. Um, it's a small weighted bag with a long line on it. So if somebody goes in the water and you're trying to help rescue them, this, this can, you know, give you a little bit of distance to, um, you know, throw something to them and they can grab onto it. And, um, you know, you, you can sit there and help pull them to their craft or pull them to shore, uh, whatever is the most uh, convenient. Next to it, the green bag with the white cross on it. That's a first aid kit. You should have one in your craft at all times. Um, nothing ruins a day more than, you know, you get blisters, um, sunburn, insect sting, uh, cuts, you know, whatever have you. Um, have something they're very inexpensive now and you can get them to where you know for under 20 bucks you can pretty much short of you know performing a um a, a, one of those uh, artificial vendor uh you know at uh what do you call it, electric shock things uh they cover mostly all the things that you're going to encounter um up here in the black and in the yellow, you could see these are bilge pumps. So these are good to have. You could store them under your deck lines again. Um, if you take on water, especially if you go overboard and you re-enter, you're gonna have a, quite a bit of water inside your craft. And these bilge pumps can really take out just about almost all of it. And, you know, it would, you know, cause these things, if they're filled with water, it's going to be really very hard to paddle. Uh, it's like paddling a bathtub full of water pretty much. So you want to get the water, uh, as much water out of there as possible. And um, then get to shore, you know, you can open up your drain plugs, you know, with your partner and then turn it upside down, drain it out and then um, put everything back in. Um, we recommend also, uh, there's a, 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 a hard shell plastic case here. Uh, I have a dry bag uh, to carry an extra set of clothes because even if you get wet in the summertime, sometimes it's not a lot of fun to paddle um, when you're, you know, you're in, in wet clothing. Okay, so uh, it's always nice to have a, a set of dry clothes. 
And this is a very important thing to have. And, and these are um, uh, feet protection. Um, so whether they're sandals, whether they're uh, actual paddle shoes, um, you know, I, I have these, these boots that kind of look like almost like, like scuba dive. Uh, I have uh, the socks for my scuba diving uh, equipment. Uh, because remember, wherever you take off or land at where you're, when you're paddling, there's a good chance that somebody was probably fishing there. And wherever people fish, you have a tendency to have snags or you know, lost hooks, lost um, lures, right, Cricket? Um, and... Um, Absolutely. <laughs> She, that was a big one I found she, the other day. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you step on a barbed hook and it ain't coming out. You're going to have to go and have it surgically removed. Uh, there could be broken glass there. You, you never know what people leave behind. So, uh, you know, forego the tan of the toes and keep the shoes on. Um, again, uh, if they're not on and you go overboard, chances are that they're going to be going down the river or somewhere else or straight down um so it had these on you're going to protect your feet and you're going to appreciate it um right now there is no legal requirement for voter education for paddlecraft doesn't exist you may want to take a screenshot of this page um Voting registration varies from state to state. Here in Illinois, we used to have one, and I think it was about three or four years ago, uh, they'd done away with it. Uh, but other states do have them. Also, the locality where you may, even if your state does not um, require some type of voting registration, um, the, you know, the locality where you're at may require some type of special use permit. So if you are lucky enough to be anywhere near a uh, paddle craft dealer, they offer some of the best um, information available on, um, um, you know, what the laws and reg uh, regulations are for your locality. Okay. <clears throat> Trip planning. Uh, this is what we call a float plan. And it, this may be a, another one you want to take a screenshot of. If you notice, there's a web page at the bottom, cgaux.org. That is the Coast Guard Auxiliary's uh, of, official web page. Um, you can uh, download a PDF of this float plan from there, print it out. And you fill it out and you leave it with somebody. And you're gonna put in here, you know, your name, your craft description, um, how many people are going with you, what type of equipment, you know, where you're gonna put in at, uh, where you plan to, you know, how long you plan to be gone, where you plan to come out at. Um, so if if you know, you say that you're, you're coming back at, you know, 7 p.m. tonight and it gets to be nine and you're still not back yet. Um, at least it gives first responders a place to start looking for you. OK, we always recommend and I know people like to sometimes paddle by themselves, um, but we, we do recommend that the, the best way to go is having three people, because if somebody gets in trouble, one person can at least stay with them to make sure that they're okay. And then the other third person can get to a point where they can either guide first responders in or summon them. So the perfect place is three, um, but we know people will sometimes go out on their own and uh, the float plan is even more important. Okay, getting to the water, this is, uh, one of the trickier things, um, I learned things the hard way, um, but you are responsible for anything or any damage or any injuries that result of your craft coming off of your vehicle. 
Um, last year in Iowa, there were a group that were towing uh, a trailer. It had several kayaks on it. And one of them came off and unfortunately it struck a motorcyclist and knocked him down and he uh, died from his injuries. Um, so I'm sure there's a, a very big civil lawsuit and um, there's probably some, you know, some type of charges against the driver uh, for not securing the, um, the, uh, the load. Um, as you can see, the uh, SUV at the top has its craft actually uh, loaded the correct way. Uh, each craft is in a, a, a J hook where it's you know sitting upright and it's cinched down to each rail and you notice there's lines at the bow, front of the uh, uh, craft, and at the stern, which is or the back, and it's tight and it's secured down. And what this does is it keeps it because if you don't have a bow and stern line, no matter how tight you got those babies on there, as you start going faster, they're going to start wobbling. And as they wobble, what they're going to do is they're going to loosen and eventually um, they're either gonna fly off or turn around. Um, and it does happen, believe me, I kind of tested this, all right? Okay, at the water's edge, um, one of the things that I made out from a, uh, just a Word document and then I had it laminated was like a little checklist. Um, um, I forget things like from time to time and actually more and more lately. Um, and you don't want to, you know, uh, try to go from memory of what you should bring. Uh, file your float plan. Um, clarify with your group, okay? If if you're, um, you know, you, there's several people there uh, and you have a first timer, you're going to want to paddle no faster than the, um, the slowest person. It, it's, you know, it's just not fun for everybody to leave somebody behind. Um, let them know uh, how far are you going to go? How, you know, when you're going to take a break? Um, any areas to, to look out for, okay? There may be some hazards. Uh, there may be some restricted areas. Um, so make sure that you communicate with the people about that. Um, and then also check your equipment. So like if you have a cell phone and it's got a waterproof case, put it in the water, make sure it is waterproof. Do that before something happens um, because if you find it's got a crack in it or it's, it's, a, it's a vinyl one and it, and it actually has a leak, better to find out there than to find out when you know, you're upside down in your, your kayak, okay? Um, you should ask yourself, should I be out here today? Because you may get out there and the water conditions, you know, you may have had several days of rain. And if it's a river, that river may be high and it may be flowing fast and it may be hiding a lot of obstructions that you would normally see and avoid. Um, so if, if that's the case, you may want to sit there and you know, maybe we can either go to a lake or, or just, you know, discretion is a better part of valor. Maybe just pack her up and, and, and get back. Um, and do you have a solution if something goes wrong? This is a, this is a big one, okay? Um, preparing yourself for that unexpected swim. Um, uh, to give an, a, an example, because um, I tell people, if you're not wearing a PFD and you all of a sudden flip over and it happens very quickly um, and you're not wearing it, your heart's going to start racing. So I said, to simulate this, <clears throat> I wanted to show somebody the, how hard it is to put a PFD on when you're in deep water. I said, go into a pool that's got a deep end and have somebody throw a PFD in the water, but where you have to swim to it a little bit. So you get your heart going up to kind of simulate that. Then try to put that on because there's, you know, 
there's two laws of physics and one is your body wants to go down and the other one is the PFD wants to stay on top and trying to put that on, you, you start becoming exhausted. And uh, if you don't get it on fast enough, especially if the water's cold, um, you can end up with some serious problems. And um, uh, actually one of the ladies, she took the class again and she, she uh, told me that um, she tried doing it and, and, and couldn't. And um, so now she's a, she's a believer. She wears her PFD all the time. On the, on the water, probably, um, and, and this goes more for people with sit-ins than sit-ons, um, one of the things that will probably make you look the least graceful is either getting in or getting out of a sit-in. Um, really strongly suggest take your time. Don't be in a hurry. Slow movements. You want to maintain at least three points of contact with your boat while you get out. So if you notice the young lady is up in the upper left and lower right, um, it's hard to tell whether they're getting in or getting out, but you can see that they're using their paddle to maintain two points of contact there. And one of their leg, at least one of their legs is inside uh, the craft. And so you will slowly um, either um, swing one leg in or one leg out, depending whether you're ingressing or regressing. So um, getting into sit-ons, are pre they're pretty easy, uh, not much required there. These are some common paddle signals. This is something you may want to take a, a screenshot of too. Um, these are the universal paddle signals that, um, you know, you may go out with a group of five or six people and you start out all together, but as you find out, as you start going further and further, you start going away from each other. And sometimes when you're out there, the wind's blowing. Um, I know myself, I have a hearing issue. Um, so, you know, and the wind and everything else, um, it, it's hard to hear people. So with these types of, of, of signals, um, you know, you can tell people to say, if you see an obstruction, tell them to back up by, by using the paddle to uh, signal to them to back up. Um, you know, stop it, to, you know, tell people to stop, you know, the help. Um, if you go over uh, and, and, you know, you, you dunk in the water, um, we have the same hand signal. Like if we are scuba diving and we jump into the water from a boat or a dock uh, and we're in the water, the first thing we do is come up and we tap the top of our head to tell the dive master we're okay. And that's, um, and always too, telling people to look for something. If you catch something catches your eye, make sure that the other people in your group also see it. Situational awareness. This is, um, I'm retired law enforcement. And one of the things that I used to teach was, um, um crime prevention. And I used to tell people to be have your head on a swivel, be aware of your surroundings. So if you're coming out of a store, you're going into a parking lot, be constantly looking around. Don't be looking at your phone. Don't be, you know, um, don't be thinking about other things, plan, plan your route. The very same thing applies to being on the water here. Um, like we have, um, on the roadways, we have people driving under the influence. We have people that are texting, talking on the phone, you know, the distracted drivers. Um, we have them on boats, all right? We have uh, people uh, operating under the influence and we have people that are taking selfies and they're texting people. Um, and one of the contributing factors to the majority of powerboat accidents is insufficient lookouts. And that means not only the person behind the wheel, but having a second person out there looking for things. Um, 
Plus they have other things looking at uh, uh, working against them. You have the reflection of the sun. Um, and um, you also, I, you know, I tell people, make yourself as visible as possible. Even when I'm on my bicycle, I have lights on during the day. I, I dress, uh, you know, with the brightest col uh, colored clothing on to try to make myself as visible as possible. Um, you can't protect yourself against everything, but you can really do things to mitigate any type of problem. So with every, as we see the uh, individual there, uh, you know, he's wearing an, uh, an orange colored PFD plus a, a, some type of shirt and uh, wearing uh, or using a, a yellow colored paddle. Um, these are, he's doing everything that he possibly can to make himself more visible to the power voters. I tell people, you know, you may want to put earbuds in and listen to music. Please do not do that. You may not hear there may be a boat or a jet ski that's bearing down on you. They may not, they may be, you know, um, and even though you have the right of way, uh, being a, a, a power a paddle powered craft, um, it's, it's not good to be right and dead. Um, so, you know, you may not, you know, uh, if you're wearing type of headphones, you may not hear them bearing down on you. So at least you can maybe get out of their way. Um, Learn some basic rules of navigation, okay? Um, I, I was really surprised that so many of the people at Paddle had no idea of um, why boats have red and green lights or why these red and green lights are on bridges or why we have red and green buoys. Um, these tell uh, mariners, boaters, um, so green is starboard or the right-hand side. Red is port, left-hand side. So if you see a boat coming at you and it's after dark and you got your paddle lights on, you know, you, you want to make sure you stay either to the left or the right of that. You do not want to go right through the center. Um, and the same thing uh, with the various buoys. We, we offer... Um, uh, uh, rules to uh, uh, rules of navigation. Um, there's a lot about the various different types of buoy markers in there. Um, uh, you can actually download off the Coast Guard Auxiliary website the PDF version of that. Uh, it's very interesting. So, um, stand up people. It, it's also you're just a silhouette and try to make yourself as visible as possible. Again. And one of the things that's going to get somebody's eye is the motion of your paddle. Um, it's going to be dripping with water. Water has a reflective ability to it. And that will possibly, if somebody's bearing down on you and it doesn't look like they're seeing you, try to get their attention. Um, again, if you see us at any of our um, um, uh, events, we give away uh, not only the whistles that I mentioned, but we have paddle reflectors. And these are like, they're like a mirror-like material and they go on both sides of your paddle. So when you're paddling, it, it's, it's like, you know, a mirrors are flashing and it just brings a lot of attention to you. We give them away. Um, what, I, what I suggest though, is that you go to the Coast Guard Auxiliary website and you can find by putting in your zip code, which flotilla is closest to you. And, um, you know, because they may go out to a lake or a river and where you're at, and they will have a table up there that have all the information, they'll have stuff to give you. Uh, they can give you vessel safety checks. Um, these are free and, um, and you can follow them. So if you find out who's the flotilla closest to you, um, you can follow them on Facebook or Twitter and, and like I know like we do, wherever we're going to be at, we post it on our social media page, you know, well in advance. So this way, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, interact with us, uh, you know, they can. So <clears throat> one of the things that we have here is, um, you know, we have an area <clears throat> here in, in northern Illinois, we have two rivers. 
um, that then, be, you know, the displays and the uh, Kankakee kind of come in together and they make the Illinois River. And, and at that point, the, the two initial rivers are, are deep enough that we get a lot of power votes. And so sometimes people that are in paddlecraft will want to go from the north side because the river runs basically east-west and they'll want to go from the north side to the south side for some reason. And if you see a boat coming at you, um, these are the response times uh, approximately. So if, if a boat's doing 30 miles an hour, um, you got about 30 seconds to get out of their way. And the faster your speed, the less time you have to uh, get out of their way. And unfortunately, as we all probably know, if somebody's had a few cocktails, um, their reaction time is going to be slowed even more. So um, again, if it's a power boat or uh, some type of commercial craft, let them go first and then, you know, go after them. And it, some of our rivers are so busy on the weekends that it's almost literally impossible to go from one side to the other uh, because of all the traffic on there. Okay, emergencies. Um, there's a whole plethora of, um, of different types of emergencies. And um, I use this one the first year of the pandemic. Um, pretty much paddle craft and bicycles sold out because all the gyms are closed. And just north of Chicago on Lake Michigan, a, a young man got out early one morning and um, he had a sit on kayak, which should not have been on Lake Michigan, but he did have a PFD on. Uh, it was very warm, so he, he was dressed, um, you know, t-shirt, shorts, sandals, so he, he was dressed reasonably well, um, but what he didn't check was the weather. And this was the first time that he went out and um, he then was starting to become a little tired. And as he would turned around to head back towards shore, he, the wind shifted and it shifted out of the Southwest and it was in excess of 25 miles an hour, which is pretty strong for sustained winds. He soon became very exhausted and because of the wind and he just kind of just gave up um, right before nine o'clock at night. And I mean, it was like almost dark, uh, a boater uh, observed him and they notified the Coast Guard station out of Wilmot Harbor and they responded with a, a boat and they actually found him five miles offshore. Um, way, way out there. Um, had he, he probably would have died from air hypothermia overnight uh, on that lake, uh, even in, in the middle of summer, um, it, because it, it, it gets cold out there. Um, another one is alcohol. Uh, and I see this, I, you know, I look at social media a lot and it's, you know, everybody's out there, oh, I'm enjoying my beverage out here and, you know, that type of thing. Save the alcohol use for afterwards because a couple of drinks, it not only dehydrates you, it affects your ability to help yourself if you find yourself in one of these uh, conditions here. And when we're, look, we're talking about drugs, we're also talking about prescription medication. So if you are being prescribed some type of medication, um, check with your doctor, because this is a physical sport. So just like doing anything physical, check with your doctor to see if the prescriptions that you are using have any uh, you know, effects uh, from the physical uh, aspect of this. Um, accidents or illness. Um, the year before, uh, husband and wife, they took a canoe out on one of the Chicago branches of Chicago River, a uh, little afternoon paddle, you know, we get out, get out of the house. Uh, they did not bring a PFD with them. And um, the husband, unfortunately, he had a heart attack and he slumped over. And when he did, it tipped the whole canoe over. Wife was able to swim to shore. 
Um, however, um, he, uh, while he had a heart attack, his actual cause of death was drowning. Had they had PFDs on, um, you know, who's to say that he would not have already died of a heart attack? But, um, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, they had to spend uh, almost an hour searching for him in the water before they were able to recover his body. So, again, please keep the PFD in. Practice a self and team rescue. You see a photo here of people conducting a team rescue. Um, one individual is helping this individual get back into his craft. These are things that you want to do. You don't want to do a one and done. Well, I did it one time, therefore I can do it. Uh, newsflash, if you already haven't experienced it, Mother Nature has a very cruel sense of humor. The older we get, the harder things become. And so you want to make sure that you your skills, um, uh, you know, you have the skills necessary to help yourself um, if the time comes. Okay, and after the problem, if there is a problem, just like having a car accident, you got to file an accident report. In, in Illinois, it's a minimum of $2,000 of property damage. You must file an accident report. Uh, this can be done with the conservation police, local sheriff's office, um, um, Coast Guard. Um, also, quite naturally, if there's an injury or a fatality, quite naturally, you'd be filing a report. Um, you know, you think $2,000, wow, that's a lot, you know, my kayak only costs, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of these composite material kayaks at, you know, there's some of them out there that, you know, we're talking five, six grand. Um, so uh, it's it's really not hard to, you know, have $2,000 worth of damage. Also, just if you do have a problem, just check with your local law enforcement agency just to make sure that there are no additional rules for the locality that would require or necessitate some type of reporting. And then after your trip, hopefully you had a lot of fun and you plan to do it again, but keep learning because it's not, again, there's so much that you are gonna pick up the more you do it and you're around experienced people. And then my biggie, I'm a very staunch advocate. I mean, we get home, we're tired, and you're like, ah, I'll clean the stuff up tomorrow. Um, one, it's easier to do it right away. And you want to clean your craft with a non-phosphate um, cleaning product, one that's made for uh, watercraft. Uh, these have no type of petroleum in them because you may not get all that petroleum-based soap off of there. And so when you go into the water, that then goes into the, you know, the water environment. And eventually after enough, you know, boats going in and out, in and out, um, you are actually, you know, causing harm to the um, uh, plant life and the, the animal life in that body of water. On the flip side, you may also if you don't clean your, uh, your watercraft as you get out, um, you may be transporting, say you go from one lake into another or going from a lake into a river, um, there may be eggs that are attached to your craft or there may be plant life that all of a sudden now you took from one environment, put it in another and it becomes an invasive species and maybe wipes out plant life or animal life in there. So. Um, these are one of the things that you really want to uh, look at. Your PFD is going to be made of some type of cloth on, on the outside. When I say cloth, it could be nylon, it could be whatever. Um, make sure, because those things get wet even by just, just getting, you know, in and out of your craft or, you know, whatever. Um, when you get home, hang them up. Uh, but do not hang them in, in direct, bright sunlight, direct sunlight, because it accelerates dry rot. Uh, just 
hang them up in your garage, hang, put them on a hanger in your shower head, you know, somewhere to let them dry. Uh, one lady posted on her, on Facebook, I saw it and she goes, uh, one reason to uh, not let your, she let her uh, PFD stay in the cockpit of her sit-in in her garage uh, on Saturday night and then Monday went to go retrieve it and it would have completely mildewed. So it, the whole thing was shot. She had to go buy a whole brand new PFD. Stand-ups, I, I <clears throat> don't use them. I have no sense of balance, um, but we will talk shortly about them. Uh, again, just like paddle craft have different sizes for different weights and, and different purposes, same thing with the stand-ups. Uh, as you could see, the young man on the left uh, is clearly on a craft that is not built for him. It's built for somebody much smaller. Um, he does not have a PFD on. He does not have a leash. He does not have any type of foot gear on. Well, the young lady there, uh, the foot gear keeps her stable and from slipping. The leash keeps the paddle uh, uh, the stand up near her if she does go for an unexpected swim. And then around her waist is a manually, because you could see the yellow handle on her right side, uh, inflatable life jacket. So if she goes in the water, all she's got to do is reach down with the Velcro, pull it up over her head, yank on it, and she's inflated. Um, 2020, we had 10 uh, fatalities nationwide involving stand-ups. Every one of them, all 10 of them, they were not wearing PFDs. These are the safety tips four stand-ups and they, they they pretty much mirror any type of um, uh, type of um, safety you know what we refer to for all type of paddle crafts okay you know wear your life jacket have some swimming ability okay um, and you know uh, I mean, I, was, I swam in high school. I was a helicopter crewman in the military, uh, both active and reserve. And, you know, we constantly were being training for going down in, in water. Um, and then after that, my swimming experience was pretty limited to swimming off the back of a boat or, or a dock or a pool. And, um, it, when I became certified as a diver, the, the diving school required us to do 15 laps nonstop. And I almost died uh, after three. And it took me, uh, if I finally passed at the end of the class, after I passed everything else, uh, I was able to bring myself back up to, you know, being able to swim 15 laps nonstop. Um, know how to tow another person. Uh, you may be going with a, you know, an individual and this could be in a kayak, this could be anything. Um, I carry a tow rope with me and, you know, somebody may develop some type of shoulder problem where they can't paddle and you may be the one that, you know, um, here, secure this to your craft and then I will tow you back to shore. So always, you know, go out there, do the right thing and be safe. Kayak fishing, this is another very, very big popular sport. Um, again, uh, you know, making it safe for yourself, making sure you're seen, making sure that uh, you're not wearing uh, any type of wading equipment. Um, and make sure that, you know, that you know that, you know, if you do go overboard, you're dealing with fishing line, fishing hooks, and all these can play uh, parts with not being able to get back in the water. So again, it's very extremely important that a PFD be worn at all times because you go overboard, you may not get a second chance to do it. And again, the safety tips, um, 
are almost identical to all other paddle craft. They added here, you know, we have cold water hy hyperthermia, and then we have hot weather uh, hyperthermia. Um, you know, this is heat stroke and uh, um, heat exhaustion. So um, again, you can take a screenshot of this. These are very common sense things. Um, and knowing your limits, that, that's a big one. A lot of people get out there right away and, and, and want to, you know, take on the world. And, and um, it's, it's a sport that you want to build yourself up to. Okay. These are something that we, again, give away wherever we are at. Um, it may sound stupid, but each year, the U.S. Coast Guard spends about forty-five million dollars of your money looking for both, looking for people that they don't have to because somebody reports an un, a, an abandoned boat out on the water, and we don't know if um, there was somebody in it and they went overboard or the boat just drifted free. So, <clears throat> again, we give these out. Uh, a good sharpie is waterproof. We would like for you if you get these, you you place them on the inside of of your craft, but we're somewhere that they could be seen. You know, don't put it so far forward that you know we almost have to like crawl on you know up to, up to the inside of your craft to see who it belongs to. Because what we will do is we will call the first number on here, and that would be the a number of the owner. And if the owner answers and we can say, hey, we got your boat here. And, uh, and it's like, oh man, it must have come loose or somebody must have taken it and well, come out here and pick her up. That's great. Uh, but if we call that number and nobody answers and we call another number and the person answers and says, well, they left me a float plan saying they were on the Illinois River paddling today. Okay, now we have a problem. Now it's a search and rescue and we need to marshal the troops. So, um, just be, um, uh, you know, help us help you, okay? Uh, because if we're out there looking for people that are not in the water, uh, somewhere else there could be somebody that's in the water and the resources won't be there for them. This is probably the one of the, the coolest things that is out there. It's a free app. It um, is, uh, works for both the iPhone and the Android. Uh, one of the really cool things about this thing, uh, besides being free, um, it gives you water conditions, weather conditions. Um, it allows you to um, uh, list up to three of your craft. Um, <clears throat> each boat, uh, no matter what the size, uh, from the smallest up until commercial um, uh, you know, uh, power craft, um, have what is called a hull identification number or HIN. So, um, and again, I was surprised when talking about it, how many people really didn't realize that their boat has a unique number. And for most kayaks, it's and canoes and rowboats, um, I'm not sure where they are on stand-ups, but I would assume they're going to be somewhere near the, the, the aft um, of the craft. Um, and it's sometimes they're stamped in. Sometimes they almost look like a riveted, um, um, like a, almost like a VIN number on a cart. Okay. And the HIN number is like a VIN number. It is unique to yours only. And from that HIN number, we could tell the make, the model, and the date it was made, and also in what sequence, okay? How, you know, because they make X amount of boats, you know, especially the plastic ones that are molded, and they can tell how many were made that day. Um, and because boats don't have to be, a lot of them don't have to be registered, there's really no way to track the owner. But if your boat gets, uh, and what's nice is, is you can list everything on this app, I actually, even for mine, I even took photos of it. So this way, if they ever come up missing and I have to report it to law enforcement, I have all the information right here. And um, <clears throat> you can also file a float plan 
plan right from this app. And you could email it to up to three people. So that's another cool thing. So you don't have to sit there and print out a piece of paper and you know leave it with somebody. You can actually just um, just fill it out on, on the phone and then send it to three people that you know uh, via email. And then you see an emergency assistance thing on the bottom. Um, that allows you, so if you're in the water and hopefully the phone's dry, um, you hit that, it'll take you to a second screen and there's another button and that will directly con connect you to the nearest Coast Guard station. And you can then report your, your uh, problem. This kind of gives you an idea of how paddling is just exploding, okay? And this tells you um, why we are probably seeing more and more people dying each year uh, as they're out on the water. Uh, <clears throat> buying your craft, and I can attest to this, I bought my first recreational boat and I really didn't know a lot, didn't, I just bought what I thought was, would be something that, uh, you know, I would want. And I went out with a few friends and somebody took some photos and I'm like, oh, okay, um, looking a little low in the water. And I was in a small lake, so it was protected. So you don't have to worry about really waves. I'm sorry, darn it. Uh, come on. There we go. And let me, there. Um, and I looked at the specs of the boat and it said maximum weight limit, 275 pounds. Now I'm close to 6'2", about 220. Um, then you add all your, your gear and stuff you know, I'm, I'm getting up to that threshold. You, you never really want to exceed 75% of the weight limit of your boat. Uh, this allows, gives, gives you some room to some wiggle room. Okay. Um, so I ended up having to sell that at a huge loss and buy another one. Now had I had a paddle store near me, yes, I may have paid more for the, the initial craft, but I would have gotten something. I would have probably been able to try out multiple types of boats to see which ones I really liked you know, over others. Um, that is the one thing about going to a, a, a good paddle store because you know these people are experienced. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, in these other stores, when you go to like a big box, um, probably a good chance that the person selling you it has never been in one. Um, if you ever bought a boat from Dick's and so when I got my, my wreck boat, it came delivered by a truck and there was styrofoam inside and stupid me, I thought I was there to protect it while it was being shipped. And so I, busted it out and removed it. And it turns out that that's what the manufacturer puts in to help keep it floating in case you go over and it fills with water. Well, I don't feel too bad because when Dick's Sporting Goods in, and this was in Oregon, um, they thought the same thing. And they sold boats to a couple of people who then were later injured very badly on a, a, a river in Oregon and are now suing Dick's Sporting Goods for a really high amount of money. Uh, and um, they, you know, as I said, they, they thought that they, you know, um, the, the, the styrofoam was there for packing protection. Um, to me, it would have been nice for the, the manufacturer to put in there, do not remove, but, you know, um, it is what it is. So, um, so, all right. These are fatalities uh, of paddlecraft every year, beginning from 1987 
when they started recording them uh, separate from um, other types of recreational boats. And as you can see each year, with the exception of a couple, there's an upward trend. The deadliest year was 2016. However, last year, or I should say 2020, um, 2020, uh, we had a 25% increase of, of fatalities over the previous year. Um, again, probably with the pandemic, people wanting to get out um, and really not having the experience or, or just thinking that paddling is such an easy uh, and tranquil sport that nothing could happen. Um, now here's, and I got to move this over to the other side here. Um, now the green line here, um, the, these are represent standups, the maroon are canoes and red are kayaks. And again, kayaks being the most numerous of all paddle craft, uh, you're gonna see more of them. Um, and, and these are at the bottom line, these are the ages of the victims, um, you know, of these various fat, uh, fatal accidents. Um, one thing that, you know, for doing this for several years now, each year, no matter where all these other, you know, these, these age lines are, there's something with this, this 19 to 29 year age. Each year, it's, it's, it's just like it spikes completely up. Um, probably one of the things I could think of is, you know, having been young once, uh, you, you kind of pretty much believe in your invincibility and, you know, immortality. Um, who knows? But that's, if somebody was going to ask, that's what I feel it would be. Okay, this is going to be a short, it's like an eight minute film. It's on cold water, um, and you're going to be surprised on what is considered cold water. And this gives me a little bit of a chance to rest my voice here. Hi, fellow paddlers. I'm Moulton Avery, founder and director of the National Center for Cold Water Safety. This video will show you why falling into cold water without the protection of a wetsuit or dry suit is an extremely dangerous situation, and also why cold shock, swimming failure, and incapacitation frequently result in rapid drowning, even for people who are considered good swimmers. Cold water is a lethal environment but it's so well camouflaged that you can stand right next to it and see absolutely nothing dangerous. Just a sparkling invitation to get out on the water and have some fun. Cold water sets a perfect trap for any paddler who doesn't take it seriously. Whether you're a relatively new paddler like kayak fisherman Nicholas Brunner, who died on June 12, 2020 in the Pacific Ocean off Trinidad, California, or a seasoned veteran with plenty of experience, like North Face founder and conservationist Doug Tompkins, who died on December 8, 2015, while kayaking with friends on a cold lake in Patagonia, Chile. If you're not prepared for immersion, you're risking your life. Most people have no idea that falling into cold water is a life-threatening situation. That's because cold water doesn't look dangerous at all. It doesn't even sound dangerous to most people. If you say 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius water to someone, they mentally compare it to 50 Fahrenheit air, which doesn't sound very cold. But there's a huge difference between the way that air and water feel. Because water is much denser than air, it feels much colder, and it conducts heat away from your skin much faster than air does. For example, 45 Fahrenheit air feels cold, but 45 Fahrenheit water feels like it's burning your skin. As soon as cold water touches a large area of your body, like your chest, for example, it triggers cold shock, a life-threatening reaction that causes you to completely lose control of your breathing. Suddenly you're gasping and hyperventilating, you can't hold your breath, and you feel like you're suffocating. 
Regular clothing offers almost no protection when you fall into cold water because it doesn't keep the water away from your skin. When you're neck deep in cold water, even in flat calm conditions and with the added buoyancy of a type three life jacket, the kind that most paddlers wear, your nose is only three inches above the water. And if your breathing is out of control, if you're gasping and hyperventilating, you have a perfect recipe for inhaling water and suddenly drowning. And that danger is even greater if the water's rough and waves are splashing your face. Many people who've heard about cold shock think it involves just a gas. But this isn't an ordinary gas, the kind you'd have if someone startled you. Cold shock gasps are full lung inflations. It's like suddenly taking a huge breath of air that totally fills your lungs. And this usually happens multiple times in a row, one gasp after another, and it's totally out of your control. If your mouth happens to be underwater when you gasp, you're going to drown. That's how fast it can happen. Cold shock also causes swimming failure. And if you're not wearing a life jacket, you have almost no chance of surviving. Accident reports of people briefly struggling in cold water before suddenly drowning are very common. They're also supported by drowning statistics, which show that many people who were considered to be good swimmers when swimming in warm water were unable to swim as little as six to 10 feet in cold water, even to save their own lives. Now we're going to look at a video of volunteers trying to swim a short distance in 45 Fahrenheit water without PFDs. They experience cold shock, swimming failure, and incapacitation. In real life, one of them would have drowned within 15 feet. Another barely made it 20 yards before his arms gave out. When you watch this, remember that it was filmed in a controlled setting. Multiple rescue swimmers were in the water with the volunteers. One of the volunteers is Mario Vitoni. Mario is an international marine safety consultant. He's also extremely determined and fit, a recently retired US Coast Guard rescue swimmer. Even so, it took everything he had to reach shore and he could barely stand when his feet touched bottom. Another thing I want you to notice is what the rescue swimmers are wearing. They're definitely dressed for immersion. They had to spend a lot of time in that water while the video was being filmed, and you don't see them struggling or grimacing. They're just fine. No problem dealing with it at all. I can't breathe. I have no control, but I think with the rest of you calling me down, at some point, like, your mind just does not work. The rest of them haven't been there. What do you think would have happened? And then It took about a minute, minute and a half to get over that. I just remember like the uh, skin started to show up from, from cold to 
For more information, I invite you to visit our website. That's where you'll find the five golden rules of cold water safety, a set of guidelines that we developed after analyzing hundreds of close calls and fatalities. Okay, so, so, <clears throat> These are some of the symptoms of hyperthermia. One of the things that, uh, if you get a chance on YouTube, it's called Cold Water Boot Camp, and it'll show you that whole uh, experiment there. Um, and and what they they came up with is uh, there's like a it's, it's one ten one. Um, you have if you go into cold water, you have about a minute to get yourself out of the water. And hopefully you're wearing a PFD because your chances of surviving that are gonna be very slim. Um, so then 10 minutes, uh, you have 10 minutes, uh, I'm sorry, one minute to get your um, breathing under control. You have 10 minutes to get yourself out of the water and you have approximately one hour of survival time uh, in cold water, um, if you are not wearing some type of uh, a dry suit or dressed for immersion, okay? And these are some of the things that can uh, get, that, that you will experience. Um, some of the things that I remember from just in the law enforcement day dealing with people that were in cold water was, was that it almost seemed like they were, um, under the influence and, and, and they weren't, but it was the, the decreased mental skills and they had like a slurred speech. It, they had a, a very hard time following directions. Uh, you know, like you throw them something to grab onto and they would sometimes even swim the opposite way. So um, it's, it's a very uh, um, painful way. So this on the bottom, um, is what we use to kind of gauge um, a little bit of our, um, what we, we uh, suggest that you uh, dress uh, for immersion. So, um, you know, anything under 55 deg degrees in the water, we strongly recommend uh, a dry suit, um, you know, uh, up to about 60 degree water temperature, um, again, it, it could be a wet or dry. Um, I think the dry suits are a little bit more comfortable. Um, water temperature above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, you, you're, you could look to dress for the weather. Um, however, again, 60 degree water is very cold. And if you are not wearing a PFD and you can't get back into your craft, you, you know, you, you will end up drowning um, from that cold water. So a little bit of a hypothermia chart here. And, 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 and this is approximations. Um, but if you notice, even 70 to 80 degree water, now you would think that, you know, hey, that's, that's pretty darn warm. Well, here's the thing. If you're going to be in it for a long period of time, and usually it's not of your choosing, um, the your your the core of your body is ninety eight and a half degrees, um, roughly, and so once you're in the water long enough, the the water starts cooling your core down, 
And if your core temperature starts going into the upper 80s, you start having organs that are shutting down. And once things start shutting down, they don't, they don't start back up. So um, that's why that, you know, even in the Gulf of Mexico, if the water temperature is in the 80s and, and you have to go overboard and you're out there overnight, there's a chance, a possibility that you can succumb to hypothermia. And if you do fall out of your boat um, and you're having a hard time getting back in, one of the things that you want to do is try to keep as much of your body out of the water as possible. Because as you know, you heard Moulton say, um, you know, water removes body heat faster than air. Um, we suggest that you swim only uh, if you're pretty close to land, because don't forget, exertion uses up body heat. And stay with the boat. It's, it's easier to spot a boat with the, the paddler and to spot a paddler by, their, by themselves. Okay, um, usually, we, you know, we call this like our, our deadly time because, uh, you know, the spring, uh, you know, into June, uh, usually we get really big rainstorms and resulting in uh, swollen creeks, rivers, um, and again, uh, they just had one over the uh, Memorial Day weekend on the James River in Virginia. It was swollen and they had 12 people go over a low head dam. Um, two of the women paddlers, the last I heard, they still haven't found their bodies. Um, the 10 of the other people were rescued by nearby paddlers. Um, they were very, very lucky they didn't end up drowning in the uh, in the swirling waters of the dam. Um, but as you see, one of the most biggest killers there are is a strainer that's in the upper left-hand corner. Um, when water's high, it, it'll sometimes um, uh, hide these types of uh, obstructions. And what'll happen is, is uh, this is where your craft will get stuck and the water power pressure is so powerful that uh, it actually keeps you underwater. Um, this is that 1% of uh, drowning victims that, you know, that, that do occur and they can be wearing a PFD um, and it really won't help them. Uh, but again, you know, it's just like wearing a seatbelt. Um, you know, only one time did I ever unbuckle a dead person, and that was when something, a, a large truck fell on top of a car. Um, yep. And, um, uh, but most of the time you have to survive the crash in order to, um, uh, you know, survive it's, uh, the actual accident. We offer free vessel safety checks. And <clears throat> to to get these, again, you can request one. Um, if somebody from the auxiliary, auxiliary does live in your area, you know, they will come out and, and give you a vessel safety check. Um, for a paddle craft, these, what we, we look at really three big things. The overall condition of your craft, um, you know, we turn it over, we make sure that it's got the, uh, uh, no cracks, no um, holes in it. Um, we make sure that it's got the flotation uh, assistance uh, items in there. We look at your PFD, and then we make sure that you have a sound uh, device. And if you have those, um, then we put onto your craft the stick, a sticker. This is what 2022 looks like. And we give you a copy of the safety check. But if you notice, there's some other boxes there. So we, uh, and, and, and this form is made to cover situations where, you know, the paddler, we may be doing vessel safety checks on the ocean. Uh, we may be doing them on, on the Great Lakes. We may do them on, on rivers. So um, it's, uh, it's made to kind of cover all situations, 
So what we would do then for, depending on the body of water where you're at, we would sit there and say, well, do you have a first aid kit? No, okay, you don't have it. Um, but we really recommend that you do get one or, you know, if you got to sit in, you know, you, you really should have a pump, uh, a dose pump and, uh, or if you're on a, you know, uh, a, a swift moving um, uh, waterway and, or you're on the Great Lakes, you really should have a spray skirt and, and that type of thing. So, uh, and again, if, if you were to fail it, there's no big thing. We just tell you, here's what you need to do to pass it, okay? Uh, there's nobody that's, you know, you're not reported or nothing else. It's just, you know, we just want you to actually be safe. Um, here's, these are two of the wiki links that uh, you can find all the information that I spoke about today. So if you want to take a, a quick screenshot of that, it's also the one for the, uh, the American Canoe Association. And we are working in consort with them to, to pr promote um, paddle craft safety. Um, if anybody is interested, actually, we have three people in our district um, that are going to be going, they will be uh, participating in a four day level two um, uh, river and uh, lake kayak instruction uh, through the ACA. And once they, um, if they pass that, then they can then uh, train some of the other auxiliarists in our district. And um, we are hoping it probably will not be this year, but we are hoping that for next year, um, we will be, you will be seeing, in, at least in our district, uh, which is nine west. So we cover pretty much from um, Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, over to Madison. And if you went straight down to Illinois, down to about Peoria, into Indiana, and then up the uh, western shores of uh, Michigan State, um, you'll be seeing in our area um, uh, auxiliarists, um, not only in aircraft or power boats, but also in our paddle craft. So if you're looking for something, uh, it's, it's to kind of give back a little bit. Um, the auxiliary is always looking for people, especially paddlers, uh, because one, you guys are fit. Number two, you have experience on the water. And three, you have respect for the water. Um, you do not have to have military experience. Um, there, you have to be at least 17 years of age. Uh, no felony convictions. Uh, we have no upward age limit. So, you know, if you're in your 80s or 70s, um, you know, if you want to just come out and volunteer, there's a wide variety of things that, you know, that we do. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in public affairs. Cricket, she's involved in vessel exams and program visitation where she goes out to different places and puts out little informational stands and stuff like that. Um, and some people get involved in cooking, some people get involved, um, uh, it's a, a lot of things, boat operations, um, uh, marine safety, I mean, you, you know, radio watches at Coast Guard stations, it's, it's, it's a really fun uh, uh, experience, okay, it's, it's, it's very enjoyable and, um, uh, you know, we don't get paid and I still do it. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. So if uh, I see there probably were a lot of questions, um, but if anybody has anything they want to ask, um, you know, of me or, or cricket, um, please speak up. Um, all right. Well, thank you everybody for, joining us and um, appreciate you, you know, taking the time and, and sitting here and listen to me drone on and uh, uh, stay safe out there on the water. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, it was wonderful and very informative. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Terry. 